a little bit about the center. Uh, the center's vision is that uh, we want all age con- consumers in Australia to experience uh, exclusive, uh, inclusive, and accessible care. Uh, and our purpose is to build the uh, capacity and capabilities of Australian aged care providers to deliver services that are welcoming, inclusive, and accessible. Uh, three of our service areas include practice uh, training and workshops, such as this one, capacity building to promote cultural inclusion and equity, um, such as the resources we have on our website, and uh, diversity advice and consulting which is our mentoring program and individual advice that we give to service providers and government bodies. The Center for Cultural Diversity in Aging is supported by Benetus and is funded by the Department of Health and Aged Care through the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care, PGAC program. Quick statistics for you. Um, There are over 420 languages spoken in Australia, including 183 indigenous languages. Uh, the top five languages used at home other than English are Mandarin, Arabic, Vietnamese, Cantonese, and Punjabi. And this is the census 2021 uh, data. And around 37% of people over 65 years were born overseas. Uh, the 2021 census data collected information from more than 120 religions and faiths. Department of Health and Aging data from 2020, around 28% of people using home care and 20% of people using permanent residential and respite care were from cold background. In this case, the Department of Health defined cold as people who were born overseas in countries other than UK, Ireland, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and USA. And there is also a culturally diverse aged care workplace. 21% of the total direct care workplace identify as being from a cult background, and the personal care workers account for 91% of all cult direct care workers. Lisa Tribusio, um, she has 20, 20, sorry, 22 years experience in a range of sectors, including Assistant Director for Inclusion Strategies at the NDIA, um, Diversity Advisor for the Hume Whittlesey Primary Care Partnership, working with aged care and disability providers, Project manager for the Victorian Arabic Social Services and researchers at the, uh, researcher at the Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. She has also undertaken cross cultural research in Egypt for the Center for Intercultural Dialogue in Cairo. Lisa is the founder of Lotus Consulting, which aims to assist organizations in developing deep understandings of diverse perspectives and practices. And she is joined today by Margaret Tuma. Margaret Tuma uh, is the Diversity and Inclusion Specialist at Uniting New South Wales ACT. She is responsible for the provision of expertise in embedding of diversity and inclusion principles in Uniting. Her role includes challenging existing structures and supporting progressive change through influencing system improvement and coordinating special projects that build diversity and inclusion capability. We want to talk about today especially is the 10-step process (laughs) to developing a diversity plan in aged care, um, which was developed by the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging. And it really was developed um, in response to um, concerns from providers around where to begin um, in this really complex process and change process um, in sort of developing a diversity plan, how to go about it, who's involved, um, how to sort of um, get commitment from senior leaders. And we're going to be talking about that today. So thank you so much for your interest in this topic. And we know that the Department of Health and Aged Care are certainly prioritising this in the aged care reform process and the aged care roadmap in line with um, recommendations from the Royal Commission. So well done for your commitment. So firstly, we're going, to, we're going to talk about the rationale in why it's important to talk about um, inclusive practice. Um, what, how do we influence our leaders and, and how do we internalise the importance um, of this concept? So let's look at the rationale, the legal rationale. I mean, it's in the Aged Care Act, isn't it? We have special needs groups mentioned in the Aged Care Act. This is complemented by the Age Care Discrimina- Age Discrimination Act, Disability Discrimination Act, Racial Discrimination Acts, 
So there's a legal rationale for why we need inclusive practice in aged care. There's the social rationale. Of course, it improves quality of care. It improves, improves the well-being of the people that we are servicing, the communities that we service, and it contributes to a peaceful society, an inclusive society, a society where people feel valued and heard. Um, what is the moral argument? Well, it's the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to do. It's the just thing to do. Do we want people being missed out in our community? Do we want people, um, do we want inequalities in our community? How do we feel about that as a collective? The business rationale. Um, so for your organisations, we know that research suggests that by adopting a diversity, equity and inclusion approach, it improves innovation productivity and profitability for your organizations because you have more consumers wanting to access your service, which in increases the reach. Um, employee satisfaction and morale, when we acknowledge a people's cultural identity, their lifestyle, and they can be their authentic self, they can stay in the workplace, they feel better. Um, it is reduced turnover and absenteeism um, for your employees. Um, increases consumer loyalty and satisfaction and they feel safe to access your service, your reputation as an innovative provider, as a provider that is inclusive, that um, recognises diversity, it stands out and it, it minimises risk and ensures compliance around discrimination um, and things, um, the costs involved when people um, feel discriminated or you know, the staff turnover, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of rationale. And we continue with things like um, the consumer. I mean, with, let's place the consumer in the middle. Ultimately, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the benefits of older people that we are servicing. So we know that when we adopt a diverse equity inclusion approach, that people feel that they feel safe, respected and heard and included, that they it does increase their health and well-being. Uh, they feel that they can contribute to the organisation and that they can be their authentic self. And we know that adopting a socially inclusive approach to practice, that this is one of the um, social determinants of health. The World Health Organization's Social Determinants of Health mentions social inclusion as a health factor. So the global approaches are things like um, the World Health Organization's Age Care Friendly Societies, the World Health Organization's Social Determinants of Health, and United Nations principles for older peoples mention social inclusion as a determinant of health and well-being. And of course, we have the national approaches, which is a Department of Health and Aged Care's diversity framework. Um, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission through the Aged Care Quality Standards embeds diversity inclusion throughout its standards. Um, we now have the Diversity Aged Care Consultative Committee, um, which is looking at diversity inclusion um, in the future, and of course, responses to the aged care. Uh, Royal Commission. So it's really important. And we encourage you to use this rationale when you are talking to your leaders. So we've got it all there for you. A copy of this presentation will be given to you on our website. Use it to create a really solid argument to your board. Just to touch upon the social inclusion as a social determinant of health. So social determinants of health, if you don't already know, are conditions in the places where people live, learn, work and play that affect health and quality of life risk and outcomes and social connectedness and the degree in which um, individuals form close bonds with other people outside their family has been linked to studies which is lower morbidity and increased life expectancy. So this is serious stuff. If people feel excluded, research has shown it it is a significant impact on their health and well-being. And over the past two decades, one in five people have reported feeling lonely and one in four Australians over 15 um, have experienced some degree of social exclusion. And we know that there are certain groups that are vulnerable to social exclusion um, through the research. And this is women, um, people over 65 and people from cold backgrounds and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people living with a disability or a long-term long health condition. Early school leavers, single parent homes, lone parent households and public housing tenants. We are talking about something that's been spoken about on a global scale here. A social exclusion through discrimination and stigmatisation can cause psychological damage and poor health outcomes. So these are some of the rationale. As mentioned before, um, we encourage you to have a look at the aged care diversity framework um, to guide some of the ways to approach um, diversity, equity, inclusion in your organisation. Of course, that was launched in 2017 and supported by the Department of Health and Aged Care as a framework. 
And these are the special groups mentioned in the, the framework to start to think about how you might want to approach some of these uh, to support some of these groups that are at risk of social exclusion, as just mentioned in the social determinants of health. And so they're the, they're the things to focus on. But of course, you know, there's it's it's about your organisation and what you're noticing um, around some of the challenges on around exclusion. One such targeted approach to um, into an organisational uh, approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion is to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. And so this is a, or a plan. And so a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan is not just one that sits on the shelf, so to speak, but would operate across the whole organisation and be ongoing. So we're going to talk about how to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan through the 10-step process. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the language that we use in this space. So when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what does that actually mean? So when we talk about equity, um, we're talking about fairness. Um, and it's quite different to it, it's different to equality because we need to address fairness before we reach equality. Um, and so fairness is about recognizing the disadvantages that exist in our community, some of the barriers that people face. And some and the ways in which people face discriminations and marginalization. And so we need to have targeted responses and more resources put in places in order to achieve equality. We know that there's some attitudes out there that people say, oh, we, we treat everyone equal. Well, if you treat everyone equal, it assumes that everyone has the same privileges, but we don't. We need to actually have targeted approaches. So that's what equity means to us. When we talk about things like diversity, that's things like that encompasses all that we make up as a person. So all the different characteristics that that shape who we are. We all have diverse characteristics and we all, you know, come up with many things in our life. And these diversity characteristics are things like, and, and when we talk about working with older people, they're things like, you know, what are their beliefs around aging? What about living with a disability? What are their beliefs around end of life care? What caring roles do they have or what what position do they have in their family? Um, what was their professional identity? Um, what's their sexual identity? Um, what are their life experiences? The trauma-informed care has been coming up quite a lot in aged care. Um, how do we address trauma? What's their spiritual identity? Um, their gender. Of course, gender is a big thing in culturally and linguistically diverse communities, in all communities. You know, we know that women have certain vulnerabilities, um, but also men have other vulnerabilities as well. So, you know, what's their mental health condition? Uh, what are their political views, et cetera, et cetera? This is some of the things to focus on and when we think about diversity. And, of course, there's their intersectionality. So it's not just one thing <laughs> that we are, is that there's many different things. And as they play and they intersect with each other, they come up with more vulnerabilities or more strengths that we can work on in supporting the older person in quality of care. And, of course, inclusion is about taking positive actions to help consumers participate in all areas of the organisation, to contribute their views, to be able to have, feel, feel welcomed and safe and empowered in their homes, which are residential care facilities, and of course, within their own homes, when people are entering their own home, that they feel safe. And we know that there's amazing work done in this space. So if you've got any good practice stories, please reach out to us because we love that peer-to-peer -peer learning as well. That's why we're collaborating with Margaret today in the Uniting New South Wales ACT. But we also have our good practice tab on our website um, <clears throat> because we, we know that you can learn from each other as well. So we're not trying to say, oh, my God, you all need to learn from us because we're the expert. No, we know that there's um, pearls out there that we need to, to really celebrate. So please bring that forward. And we did have our Excellence Awards as well which celebrated nine good practice stories through the Department of Health and Aged Care, recognising that. Um, thank you so much, Juliana, for that link to our good practice stories. All right, so over to the 10-step process now in developing a diversity plan in aged care. So where do we actually begin with all this kind of stuff? The Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging advocates for a policy approach to supporting the needs of diverse consumers rather than just saying, oh, okay, well, you know, we've got a program where we link older people to Harmony Day, for example. I mean, that's not going to be sustainable. So what we encourage is a, is a policy approach and a whole of organisation approach. So this is the 10-step process here. We're not going to go through all the 10 steps now. They are available on our website through our practice guide, but we're going to actually go through each step individually. So the first step is getting commitment from your board or your executive team. So this is really hard because you, you need to convince your managers and your board and your leaders why it's important if they don't already have it embedded in your organisation. So if they don't, um, 
it's about presenting a business case to get your board or executive team to truly understand why diversity, equity, inclusion is important and the rationale for having a diversity, equity, inclusion plan, which we just mentioned, includes the moral reasons, the social reasons, legislative reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And that having a diversity, equity, inclusion plan can assist your organisation to get a good reputation for being inclusive and applying a person-centred approach in line with aged care quality standards. And it'll also um, keep the board and executive team accountable for meeting their targets. So what we're going to do now is go over to Margaret to have a little bit of a conversation about how Uniting New South Wales ACT got commitment from their board to develop the plan. Over to you, Margaret. I actually think that you've captulated um, the essence of trying to capture the commitment from the board and executive team really well in that first early slides. And I actually encourage everybody to really have a really good look at those slides when you're when you get hold of these hold of the deck. In terms of uniting, what we did, we actually paused and asked a couple of questions. And firstly, why tackle a diversity inclusion strategy in the first place? And what are the opportunities? And from that, the only way we could um, move forward to look at the capturing the hearts and the minds of our board and executive team was to elevate the lived experience voices of our people. So we set up a small team and we had um, people from a number of different um, identity groups with um, lived experience and um, and a commitment across the organisation, that team was really charged with building the compelling evidence that we take back, that we took to the board. And that compelling evidence mirrored what Lisa had talked about earlier, but we also um, had a strong focus on community expectation, looking at the community and looking at the evolving process of, of demographics and, um, and went very much to the heart of our of our um, commitment and our values. So that would be one of the tips that I'd actually be encouraging people to think about. Really, what's the what's your organisation's mission and really touch on those sort of core elements around um, inclusion and a sense of creating a better world. And we, we so we worked quite hard on that. And what we also did was really look at the, the, the process of, of maturity. Where Uniting was um, at that point in time was we had different strategies for different groups, but we didn't have a consolidated strategy. And to get to that next level of maturity and move from a focus just on diversity to inclusion and now belonging, we actually need to have a strategy in place where we've got accountability at the board level and executive um, team level. And that, I mean, that really pretty much was what we focused on. And we looked at all of the different aspects around our brand, our workforce capability, um, we looked at our uh, consumer process of, of acquisition and as well as our, our marketing and a range of other aspects. But the important thing, I suppose, about opportunities was intersectionality, authenticity and, and getting to the point of moving from diversity to inclusion. And we encourage you to have a think about as we go through the steps where you think your organisation may be at and some of the challenges and complexities around that. Step two is partnering with a leading organisation or a diversity consultant um, to support your 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 approach um, because it's not always it's, it's it's hard to do it by yourself or you know without an expert in place that have consciously thought about this and so um, you, you can reach out to the partners in culturally appropriate care program providers in each state and territory um, and there's also a range of diversity consultants that operate independently as well as networks and organizations that, such as the eon network which is the Equal Opportunity Network, um, who have a range of diversity consultants or the Diversity Council of Australia, to which you, you can become a member of, um, to sort of have a look at how you might engage a peak body. So over to you, Margaret. How did you go with this one? We spent quite a bit of time looking at researching and looking at ec expertise in the sector, and we did link in with a number of key organisations. So looking at Diversity Council in Australia, Pride in Diversity, Australian Network of Disability, we also worked with CBA, Deloitte, um, Boston Group, a number of other corporate organisations that had um, a very strong social justice and social impact um, mission or values in, in terms of their organisation. And one of the points here that I think is really important to raise is that you don't actually have to, depending on your budget, you don't have to spend much money at all. You can subscribe to a number of different email groups like OPAN and, and Lookout and DCA Diversity Council of Australia, and you don't have to be a member of that organisation. You can get resources for free through that that um, 
through being part of, of that email distribution list, we internalised and looked at a restructure within the organisation and we built in the consultancy support and advice within the diversity inclusion team and that's where I come in. So I'm pro- I provide, as well as um, my partner, um, Fiona Crittell, um, we're a very small team and we provide that um, consultancy um, advice to the organisation. So, but we're a large organisation, so that's why that's why uh, it really does depend on your budget and how you how you'd like to go about it. But definitely partnering with organisations is key. We also um, do quite a bit of work with the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Aging, as well as our PICAC New South Wales ACT, and linking with a number of organisations. Great um, sort of commentary from the field there, because. <laughs> what you're doing on the ground and some really good advice around it doesn't have to cost that much. It can sort of be more of a collaboration or if you do have the funding to employ a consultant for over short term to start the ball rolling, that's another business case you could potentially raise with your leaders. Step three is um, creating a diversity, equity, inclusion working group. And the reason for this is because one person can't do everything um, and the working group is about who in your organisation is um, interested in this topic, um, who are the change makers, who are the people who are responsible for, say, learning and development or um, quality improvement, um, could be, you know, some of the some of the managers, the residential care managers or lifestyle managers or whoever's interested. Um, and so we encourage to have a little group. It could be three to five people to start with, just to um, keep the conversations going um, and to keep the momentum of the topic. Um, and the group should have like a, a clear terms of reference with some clear objectives. Um, and some of the um, things that they could do is things like promote some of the training and events to bring awareness within your organisation around diversity and inclusion, key significant days or events, um, encourage workers um, to also have the conversations and to sort of review policies and practices, but also to communicate the plan that you're looking at across the organisation. So in the absence of a diversity equity inclusion committee, you might be able to hire a consultant to run this group. So Margaret, did you have a committee? Uniting is quite large and big. So we, we employ over 9,000 people and provide support to over 100,000 clients. So um, we needed to put into, into place this, the governance and the structure. So at the top level, we've got what we call the diversity inclusion council and that's at an executive level and that's that has the voice has the the link directly to the board underneath that we have our um, networks what we call employee networks um, across the different identity groups of aboriginal um, lgbti q plus cultural diversity and disability inclusion so that's where the lived experience and the voices of people um, help inform um, any policy change or look at providing commentary on practice and a range of other sort of um, initiatives that we're working on. So probably one of the things that's really important, if you are going to set up a working group, ensure that you've got people with lived experience in that working group. Um, That working group will drive and help inform uh, any future initiatives. It also will go to the heart, I think, of the executive and the board around the storytelling so it has that authenticity in it. And I would be strongly suggesting that you look at that. The other thing is that we, we do have a terms of reference. Um, really happy through Lisa to, to share um, an example, if that's going to help. We did have just a question. Were any board members part of the working group? The Diversity Inclusion Council um, is the executive team and they report directly to the board. So the board are not part of the working group as such, but the executive and the briefing and the reports that we provide around progress across the um, implementation of the strategy goes directly to the board. But the board are very much aware of um, the strategy and and were very much part of the initial launch and there are regular updates that go to the board. So there is a structure in place to ensure that we get from the ground up in terms of people from those identity groups actually having a voice and elevating that voice to ensure that it goes to the board so changes and practice um, is improved as a result of that. We have a few people interested in the terms of reference. So what we'll do is we'll send that through email through your Eventbrite registration. So thanks so much for that. And step four is um, 
Reviewing consumer and workplace data. So this is where we look at the diversity of the organisation with your staff and with your consumers and people who may be missing out from um, accessing your service. So it's about collecting diversity data and collecting local demographic data is critical in comparing service usage with local ageing populations and also how to market for potential consumer groups. Um, workforce data helps you plan your recruitment strategies to ensure consumer diversity is reflected in your workforce. And we, we have a diversity and demographic, a data and def- demographic practice guide, but we also have just run a very big webinar um, around collecting diversity data, which was with the SBS and the H- Australian Institute of Health and well, well, uh, Welfare, who were looking at how to collect diversity data. Um, and so we encourage you to have a look at approaches in uh, collecting diversity data for your staff or for your consumers. Um, and without the diversity data, then how can we know how to respond to things? Um, and so, Margaret, how did you go about collecting diversity data? Because it is a very interesting topic around yeah. if people are sensitive to disclose their, you know, aspects of their diversity as well. So how do we, how did you address that one? A couple of things there. Just to go back to that webinar, I also provided the uniting experience in that webinar. So I do agree with you, encourage people to have a look at that webinar on collecting diversity data to inform um, better practice. So uniting, um, I suppose part of our journey really when we're looking at data, consumer and workforce data, is we've got diversity data, but it's getting to that point of actually um, to that maturity level of actually also capturing the inclusion aspect of the data because that really helps around informing practice also. The cha- there, are, there are challenges around looking at identification data, looking at the cultural safety, looking at people feeling um, okay and um, to, to identify, to self-identify um, with coming from particular um, identity groups. And I think part of that is really providing that sort of framework out why are you collecting the data, where is the data going to be stored, ensuring and what's the use of that data? What are we going to use the data for? So we did a lot of work on that, particularly around our workforce, and we're able to then um, look at going into some um, deep dives into collecting data on LGBTIQI status as well as disability data. And with the call data, we we went further beyond um, country of birth and language, we've actually expanded it to look at um, cultural background and heritage and recognising that people may be born in Australia um, to, as an example, to Lebanese parents, um, but identify very strongly with that ancestry and really critical because that's part of responding to the cultural aspect of of people's um, identity. So we, I suppose, it's looking at our people, our, our clients and our communities, and that's really how we've looked at it. And we continually look at reviewing our data um, and look at um, developing benchmarks so we can actually see progress or or not over over the the span of um, the the life of the strategy. Step five would be undergoing an organisational assessment. So this is to um, assess your organisation as to where they're at on their inclusive service journey. Um, And the inclusive service standards, which were developed by the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing, assists aged care organisations to become equipped at addressing the diverse needs of their consumers and they provide a framework to embed a systemic and holistic approach that focuses on adapting and improving services that are safe, welcoming, accessible for everyone. And we have an organisational assessment tool. So um, we can support you in doing a, a first assessment as to what you're doing really well around diverse, equity, and inclusion and what are the things that you want to work on and to set your goals and to start to create an action plan um, and to review your current practices. So we have three standards and 16 performance measures. Um, If you go onto our website, you'll be able to see our assessment tool under the Inclusive Service Standard resources on our homepage. We can support you in um, applying and using um, the assessment tool. So, Margaret, did you have to do an assessment? Yes, we did. Look, we we, um, did a three-month um, desktop assessment where we looked at um, demographic data, internal de- demographic data, and we benched that against the external data sets that were available. We also looked at um, a range of, and also looked at research and reports and and then did a deep dive into our operational and corporate um, activities and also had conversations with external and internal partners. 
I think one of the things here is that um, the assessment, I really encourage people to look at what the, the tool that's available on the centre's um, website. That's definitely uh, an important starting point. There is a, um, a continuum tool called the Equity Continuum Tool produced by Trevor, Trevor Wilson. And what's important here, this goes back again to developing the business case. So if you've got the opportunity to undertake the assessment that, um, that Lisa talked about, and then get a, a, a sense of where you're at, where your organisation's at on developing the diversity inclusion strategy. It gives you an idea where, where the organisation thinks they sit and in reality where they might be. So ultimately where you want to be is, is at five and moving, for, moving beyond that. And that's when we're talking about inclusive and equitable organisations. So it really is about that journey and we did undertake an assessment of this um, journey across it with each of our directors at that high level, executive um, level, and interesting to see how um, the differences in, in opinion here. But this is also, you know, if you're looking at presenting your business case, then that really um, getting to the, the heart and the minds of your leaders, is, this is probably a, something to complement very much what the tool that's available on the Centre's website. That's really interesting to sort of not only where you're at with your policies and practices and procedures, but where you're at with your mindset um, and where you, you feel like your organisation's on in their readiness. Um, so are they in a compliance mindset or more of a sort of in, looking at innovation? So step six is then after you've done your assessment is then looking for areas of improvement. Um, so you've identified your diversity data of your organisation and your staff. Um, your population, you've done an audit, an organisational audit, and looks at your assessment and some of the gaps. So now you can begin to identify areas of improvement and develop targets and objectives. So, for example, if you found out that there's an underrepresentation of certain consumers from a certain cultural group, for example, you might have in your local community newly arrived communities from Arabic-speaking backgrounds, but they're not accessing your service, then you might want to target that group. Or you might have a look at the data and know that 10% of our community identifies LGBTIQA+, but no one has disclosed that in your organisation. So you've got 0% within your staff or your consumers, so you might want to focus on that. Or you might see that, you know, we know that um, at least 20% of our community are living with a disability that's not visible. Um, a lot of them is not visible. So how do we address disability within the organisation and accessibility and inclusion um, and we know that people over 65, but the majority of them who access aged care services are living with a disability. So how would you approach disability, for example? These are just some examples. So as you've noticed some of these gaps in your programs, um, how do you then identify areas for improvement and set objectives towards diversity groups and approaches? So, Margaret, we know that your diversity equity inclusion plan had certain groups that you addressed. So how did you go about addressing, uh, targeting those groups there was a historical aspect of looking at the, the cultural diversity, people, disability, Aboriginal and LGBTIQ plus um, groups that were established and they have been for quite a while. And that goes back to our values and our mission. So I suppose it's, it does go back to the demographic um, profiling. We have also looked at community expectation and looking at that sort of the population. Now, we all know there's diversity within diversity and the intersectionality aspect of that. We also know that there's a growing, a significant growing um, called population, and we have a responsibility to respond to that. So part of what we did was very much workshop um, with each of our identity groups um, to look at identifying where there are gaps and, and developing goals. So in our strategy for our four priority groups of Aboriginal and I'll use I'll say the word called with all respect if that's okay with everybody, um, and disability and LGBTIQ plus. We've got our four specific goals. Those goals mm -hmm. translate to initiatives and priorities and action. Um, so that and that was again, it's about elevating the voices of our people with lived experience and how that then in, it informs improvement and the progression of actions and initiatives to support the the work that we need to do. To, um, to really help create a, a more inclusive and, and better world. So then once you've er identified areas of improvement, it's about setting up an action plan. So you've looked at the gaps, you've looked at the diversity data, you've looked at some areas of improvement. Now you want to say, what do we actually want to do? <laughs> 
So what are the actions you want to start with, uh, with uh, looking at key initiatives and performance indicators? So um, the action plan may have clear timelines. It could be short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. You might want to start just with some short-term goals. Um, in the next six months, what would you like to achieve? Um, what are the, some of the deliverables? And um, this might be overseen by the working group that we talked about before who have clear roles and responsibilities. And you may want to set a budget. <laughs> So this is where it gets complicated. I mean, we all know that we're all, there's a lot of financial stresses happening in aged care, but it's worth it. Putting a budget toward these initiatives are worth it because the outcomes are so important. Um, and maybe you might want to get, this is where you want to get, look, look at the budget um, for supporting some of the actions, or maybe some of the actions might not need a budget in the first instance. Um, and it's important to get your management and board to endorse your action plan here. So, Margaret, how did you go with your action plan? Yeah, look, so I suppose the action plan, um, it, you know, it's the strategy. And um, we don't, look, we don't have a specific budget that goes with our with our, um, our plan. Basically, it's about um, mobilising and getting traction from across the business. So when you start looking at the action plan, it's going to cover off on recruitment. It'll cover off on marketing. It'll cover off on cultural safety, and they're all aspects across the business that um, would need to um, have a have a responsibility to contribute towards that. So that's really part of it about embedding diversity and inclusion into everything you do. So it's about that rubber stamp of DNI, as we call it. So um, part of it, I suppose, is just being one of the tips is. Um, have an aspirational plan, but very mindful of what you can actually achieve. And those small steps, even looking at, you know, we've got Diwali coming up, there's some great opportunities to just get your, get your services involved, get some bright colours out there, get the decorations, and people start to talk. Take photographs, put them on social media, um, make sure that the board and the executive are aware of what you're doing, and get some anecdotal information back from your consumers about how much fun they're having that all helps to build it up and um and help to create that that you know that plan so there are some things you can do without uh, much money at all um or very little but I think you're probably doing more work than what you think so part of it's just writing it down and uh, and then the ability to articulate it and to be heard by the executive team just to remind everyone that we do have our tips and template, um, tip sheets and templates to support any of these um, steps, which are available on our website. So if you wanted to look at some actions, we've got some example actions, we've got some example uh, performance measures, we've got our example um, performance measure template. So you can actually start to look at actions from our templates. And of course, reach out to us if you need some support. So step eight is, um, so as you've now looked at what are the actions you want to take, it's implementing the actions and the initiatives across the organisation. So these can range from reviewing, changing or creating new policies, um, new diversity related policies and practices, diversity staff training initiatives, um, conductive target, conducting targeted diversity, equity, inclusion awareness events, and partnering with diverse communities and um, other targeted programs to name a few um, and it is recommended that you take that you make the diversity, equity, and inclusion the responsibility of every employee um, throughout the organisation. Um, and so this is where it's like some of the initiatives that you did, uh, Margaret. So what are some of the things that you actually did in your organisation? You talked about significant days like Diwali or Chinese New Year, for example, or Harmony Day. They're, they're sort of the more one day, nice, fuzzy, beautiful, warm, lovely things. But of course, there's the boring stuff, isn't it? There's the admin stuff, like creating a diversity plan, like collecting data, um, like how to roll out a, a diversity training program to the staff. So could you give us a few examples of what some of the actions you took? One of the first things is, I suppose, just looking at awareness days across the different identity groups is to have an integrated awareness day calendar that looks at that everything's so a dementia week, mental health week, a palliative care week, and then you start to embed the diversity and inclusion aspects within that. So having that and having your communication people on board with that, so then you're actually they're working they're working for you <laughs> rather than you having to sort of um, negotiate or do any arm wrestling to to get um, Lunar New Year or Harmony Week or or Diwali or um, you know we've got 
Mardi Gras coming up next year, which is World Pride, a significant sort of event also when you're looking at LGBTIQ+. So that's just one initiative. The other, the other is around training, and the training part is about, again, co-designing. So looking at the opportunities to hear what um, your people are saying around the workforce capabilities that are needed to improve and increase awareness and education across different cohorts and getting people involved in that. With the other part, which is really important, is around inclusive leadership. So, you know, what, what training programs are already in place and how do you then embed the diversity and inclusion aspect to that? Um, and that's why I think having um, a working group that has enabling functional areas from your corporate um, area would be of great value. And um, and if they're on, on board, and, and hopefully they will be, then you're able to then collectively work on some of the initiatives that you need to be putting in place. There's one of the important things here is that um, getting diversity inclusion on the agenda um, is something that we've... Um, worked on quite hard at Uniting and it's just gone through the Diversity Inclusion Council meeting, the last one we had in September, where we're needing to and and well we will be um, moving towards diversity inclusion standard agenda item item at, at each of our team meetings. So it becomes normal business. It's not an add-on, it's not something that's that's different on you. It's just part of what we do. And I think it's about that's really where you need to go. So these initiatives shouldn't be stand standalone. They should be incorporated into existing initiatives that you've got at the moment. I just wanted to comment on the fact that putting diversity, equity, inclusion on each team meeting agenda is definitely an action and on um, performance appraisals. Just going to go through quickly now step nine and ten, which is communicating your diversity strategy across the organisation. So if you can now imagine that you do have a diversity, equity, inclusion strategy and you've got a working group and you've got your action plan, and you're implementing some of your activities, you now want to actually promote it across your organisation. Um, it could be um, your senior leaders articulating it. It could be in your mission statements, in your annual reports, on your website, um, on your social media channels, or through a public launch. So, Margaret, how did you go about promoting your strategy? I think you've really touched on all of the critical points there, Lisa. One of the first things I think, once you've got your plan in place, um, I strongly encourage you to look at a public launch, do it on Zoom, invite invite everyone in the organisation and look at your key state, external key stakeholders. Um, that would really help around accountability, particularly at the board and executive um, level, because you're, you're committing the organisation to this strategy as well as to the, the goals and the initiatives and the KPIs that have been set. That really helps to keep to keep it alive and to give it some legs. So that's what we did. Um, we continually look at socialising our strategy. It, it's every single day, it, it, everything I do is a promotion of the strategy. And part of that promotion, and part of this is also looking at how we evaluate, how we bring it back, and then we continue to look at the plan, do, check, that cycle. So um, we are continually improving on how we, we look at um, communicating. So we use Yammer, we use social media, we use um, chat groups, we have meetings, we have face-to-face Zooms. There's a whole range of things that we do. We've, got a, we've also structured our internal, um, internal intranet site to have a specific page on diversity inclusion, and we have all that all the important information that's in there. So it's a one-stop shop. People know where to go and that's continually updated. I love how you've integrated it across the organisation. Now, the final step is measurement. Um, so measuring the outcomes and reviewing and evaluating if you're doing a good job or if you're, you know, you're on track. Um, so, again, imagine you've got your plan. Everyone knows about it. It's on your website. It's, um, on you know, in your all your key documents, um, it's doing really well. How do you actually measure change and measure the effect it has on your service? So, and, on, and to your consumers especially. So some of the outcomes are, you know, represent, representation of consumers accessing your service, um, consumer feedback, workforce representation of diverse communities, attitudes towards staff around whether they feel included, whether they feel safe, whether the diversity is recognised and they feel culturally safe. Um, whether you've got any new policies or procedures in place around diversity, equity, inclusion, um, 
who's who's done your training, and then obviously the creation of your strategy and the progression of your strategy. So let's have a think about, um, Margaret, some of the outcomes to date that you've achieved um, and what are some of the um, quality indicators, measurement tools that you've used? Pretty much what you've got here. But I think, again, where we are right now is really looking at the measurement of inclusion. And that's where that that difficult bit is um, and trying to get to that point of a sense of belonging. So we're actually looking at different ways of actually capturing data, that data, and how that will then translate into better practice. Um, we, we've got seven pillars, and they're our focus areas that go across from inclusive um, leadership right through to measurement. So that is about, um, and looking at some realistic KPIs, KPIs that are measurable. There's no point in putting in a KPI that you can't measure or you can't collect data on. You really need to make sure that you, you do that. So And, and having, having each of the points accountable to where they should sit. So if it's an HR matter, it needs to be accountable at that level. So um, it's then owned by the whole organisation. And again, um, we're now at the point where we've got a midpoint review of our strategy. So we're doing deep dives into some of these areas and um, looking at, okay, what's the next step? How do we go to the next step of aspirational um, goals? Got some key considerations that you can read through our 10 steps to developing a diversity, equity, inclusion practice guide. And of course, <laughs> these are some of the things that have come up in your polls, which is thinking diversity, others, people. Sometimes talking about diversity, equity, inclusion can make people feel othered or can make people can, can make people feel a bit vulnerable. So that's a really, really good point as well. So it's not about targeting people. It's about having an inclusive organisation that they don't have to disclose, that they can just feel that maybe they might want to disclose when they're ready or they might just feel okay with not disclosing. Lack of change readiness, lack of time and staff. These are some useful resources to, um, to follow up with. We talked about the diversity action plan. We talked about the framework, um, the Uniting's diversity strategy to have a read through, and, of course, the Partners in Culture Appropriate Care website and Diversity Council of Australia resources. We do have our diversity webinar series for the next financial year, so check that out. The next one is supporting older people from culturally diverse backgrounds with a hearing impairment, and then we're going to continue next year with um, some other topics, our inclusive service standards resources, which we talked about before, our portal, and our diversity mentoring program. So um, we encourage you to look at our website and, and, you know, have your voices heard through our Have Your Say survey. We'd like to thank everyone for your contribution today. Um, our podcast, of course, <laughs> uh, which has just recently been launched, which uh, Margaret does talk about um, the strategy further, but we've got other guest speakers, Margaret and Fiona. Um, and, yeah, it's been really good. So check that out on our website, our practice guides, um, our poster for presentation and the Partners in Culture Appropriate Care website. So thank you so much, everyone, for your contribution today. And for Sarah Burrell-Davis, who's our digital content producer and consultant who's behind the scenes. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.